Major General Jensen is here with us, and he is the Commanding General of Marine Corps Installations East. He uh, graduated from Northern Illinois University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Journalism, but also has a Master of Science degree in National Security Strategy from the National War College. And I'm not going to read all of his bio, but I really encourage you to do so. And, uh, but he has, uh, he has been deployed in support of Operations Desert Shield, Desert Storm. He was also um, deployed in 2006 in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, he has twice served as Commander Task Force, um, commanding all the coalition of naval and marine forces operating the North Ar Arabian Gulf and Iraqi territorial waters. He has also been, um, it's, it's been a lot. You've been a lot, and uh, we are really honored to have you here with us, and we really appreciate you coming. And he is going to, as I said, talk about a very interesting program that fits in so well with everything we have talked about this week. So here we go. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm, uh, Frankly, a little humbled uh, to stand in, in front of uh, all you rocket scientists and, uh, and, and talk about this. I have brought with me, however, my own rocket scientist, Mr. Paul Friday. Would you stand up for one moment? And it was, we, uh, we had a little discussion back in, on the home front as to who was actually going to pitch this, and uh, the secretary said the, the best looking guy ought to pitch it. <laughs> so I lost out on that. And my chief said the guy with the least hair, so you got me. Um, I am Major General Carl Jensen, and, and I will tell you, I, I've been in the service of our nation for about 36 years now. And as a Marine, as you might expect, I am extraordinarily interested in national security and national defense. But I'll tell you something else. I've been an American for longer than 36 years. And I am extraordinarily, exquisitely interested in environmental security and environmental defense. And that's a fact. I can figure out how to work this thing. There we go. Okay. Uh, my domain here, such as it is, stretches from, uh, from Virginia, the air facility at Quantico, Virginia, all the way south to, uh, to Blunt Island, Florida. So there's a, there's a lot of turf here, a lot of separate uh, ecosystems, uh, wide range. As you can see from the numbers there that I will not reiterate, I've got a lot of folks that, uh, that depend on me to do the right thing and a uh, rather significant economic impact with a B behind it, uh, which always wows me. This is what I'd like to talk about, and it's, it's looking to the future, and it's, it's landscape-level planning, but my entire theme here is, is partnering. Nobody can do this alone. You know, the military tried to, uh, to, to buffer our lands so we could train, so we could uh, have an enduring mission for some time, and we just can't do it alone. And neither, I would offer, can anyone else's organization in this room do it alone. But if we work together on this, if we partner and leverage each other's money, each other's ideas, each other's enthusiasms, we can work miracles. I guess I just got done with this slide, huh? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I need, obviously, buffer areas around my, my military encampments. Every service does. Because if, if, uh, if the civil sector encroaches right up to our, to our borders, we can't adequately train. But, you know, there's more to it than that. Um, it's also our ranges and our flight routes and a plethora of other areas where we need to ensure that we're not encroached upon to the point where we can no longer train uh, because then, frankly, we will have to go somewhere else to train, and that somewhere else would probably be the West Coast. Um, 
and, and we would rather not do that, frankly. Um, the bottom bullet applies. We've got to work together with federal, regional, state, local, military, whoever will partner with us. We're interested in partnering with you. This is a, uh, an example of something we gave the, uh, the governor of North Carolina for planning purposes. And as simple as this is, and all this depicts, is where our, our major range, uh, our major bases are in uh, eastern North Carolina and some of our military training routes where we fly aviation assets. We cobbled together an outfit known, known as the NCCC there, the North Carolina Commanders Council. And one of the first things we did was provide the governor a map overlays of what we consider important to the military in North Carolina. As simple as that sounds, it's never been done before. Uh, so the, the governor can look at this and say, okay, this is, what, this is what's important to the military and how can I work with them, how can I work with others? Uh, and it's proven to be a very powerful tool. We also looked at this from a uh, kind of a red, yellow, green standpoint and provided her other overlays here that if, uh, if something is, if we marked it yellow, we have a real interest in what's being built in that area. If it's, if it's red, we have a critical interest in what might be built in that area. So we can, we can have this discussion early on before something actually comes out of the ground and we try and, and, and uh, beat it back then. Much easier to do proactively than reactively. I know that's a shock to all of you in the room. This is, uh, this is a little trip back in time. You'll notice 1940 housing density. Uh, you, you can guess where this is going. Uh, this is the great march to the sea. Basically, yellow is evil carbon-based life forms uh, coming our way. This is what it looked like with our overlays there in 40. This is 2000. You'll notice a considerable difference. Come on. Work for me. And there's 2030. We're going to look like Myrtle Beach here on the eastern seaboard unless we do something about this, unless we take steps to mitigate, unless this is what the state of North Carolina would like to look like. Um, uh, Governor Purdue is very interested in keeping farms and farming and forests and forestry and maintaining the fundamentally agrarian nature of eastern North Carolina. Not every state is like that, and we intend to help her with that. We intend to do that by partnering. Partnering across the board, wherever it makes sense, wherever we can move the ball, and you can see everything you can possibly think of from federal level all the way down to the, to the very, very local level. Let's get everybody involved, put all our shoulders behind this, and get something done. That's the most important thing. We gotta get something done. You know, we have lost so much time and so much opportunity at this point. This is all about now. Gotta do it now. We have run out of time. One of the great outfits that I, I hope you are all familiar with here in this room, or most of you, is, is Surpass. Um, holy smokes, what a powerful organization that is. You know, particularly when you're talking to the feds and you can talk, no, 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 this is not just my state or my community. This is six states talking here. And by the way, we're of one mind in the matter, and this is what interests us. This is how we would like to proceed. We need some help. Phenomenal. I mean, absolutely grand organization. And you'll also note uh, there this, the urgency of now is, is a part of this outfit, uh, and that's why I love it. When we get together, we, uh, we have some great discussions. A little bit fast, there we go. 
some a drill down into uh, some of the North Carolina partnerships. And this is, you're going to see a lot of North Carolina here, and it's not because we, uh, we don't love every other state on the eastern seaboard, uh, but it's because uh, North Carolina has been particularly proactive uh, in, in this regard. Uh, again, just another uh, example of partnerships here from strategic lands all the way around the landowner preference surveys. We are very interested in what the local landowners are interested in. What motivates them? Um, how do we get them on our side for too long? Let's face it, the Marine Corps has been this ungainly 800-pound uh, gorilla who storms into the room and, and wants to have its own way, right? And, and we're trying to uh, change our image and change our image not just through uh, some PR campaign but actually by, by doing some great work. I'm going to go off on a tangent now just because it, it occurred to me. Um, you know... In the past, you could make an argument, I suppose, I, I think this was more out of ignorance than out of uh, evil intent, but that the military was not exactly the environmental guardian that it could have been. Um, I really do think that was out of ignorance, and because if you look at the, uh, the s civil population as well, we were all astoundingly ignorant of the effects that we could have individually and collectively on the environment. It's just a fact. But I will tell you something now. There is no better guardian of the ecosystem and the environment, in my personal opinion, than the United States military. I know that because I hire people by law, I have to hire people who do nothing more than guard the environment, who ensure that, that all my T's are slashed and my I's are dotted. As a commander, I can be held personally reliable for damages to the environment. Personally. I mean, this is coming out of Mrs. Jensen's pocketbook here. <laughs> If I am accused of something, I cannot even use a government lawyer to defend myself. I have to privately retain counsel at, you can imagine, huge expense. So all of my commanders, subordinate commanders, we take this stuff extraordinarily seriously, and we are, I like to think, phenomenal stewards. Uh, and not only that, we have the money to do this. Prescribed burns, sampling, those types of things. Other outfits don't. We do. We've got the right guys to do it. We've got professionals, highly trained, and we get it done. This is another fine uh, eye chart here that, that just sh so shows some of the trickle down, how this works between, you know, the, the, at the, at the multi-state level at Surpass over to state, down at the, uh, at the county region and then way down local, um, working together toward a common end and energizing everyone in this enterprise. I'm going to read this quote just because I, I love the living dickens out of it. Nevertheless, the record clearly shows that conservation can't succeed by charity alone. It has a fighting chance, however, with well-designed appeals to self-interest. The challenge now is to change the rules of the game so as to produce new incentives for environmental protection geared to both society's long-term well-being and the individual's self-interest. This is the ticket right here. There has to be something in this for individual landholders, for individual stakeholders, for collective stakeholders. We've got to make this, pardon me, sexy. We've got to make this attractive to these folks if we're going to succeed in a grand manner. 
Uh, I won't bore you with the, the four stages of conservation. Uh, suffice it to say, we would like very much to get to the desired end state as quickly as we can, where we have this amazing convergence of natural resource, working lands, and national defense interest, and connecting these valuable landscapes at larger scales. That's what I would like to see. That floats my boat, and I would offer that it, it floats an awful lot of boats in here, and it's the right thing for our nation. This is kicking my butt. <clears throat> okay. Did I say that? I guess I did. <laughs> Sentinel landscapes. I know you've never heard that term before. Um, Something we're, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, you can read the, uh, the, the concept, but the underlying portion is, is very important. Private landowners recognize for the unique value of their land. Um, you know, in the past when the, when the military uh, was interested in, uh, in getting an easement, we were only interested in perpetuity. Got to have lifetime, you got to Give us the rights to this. We will pay you good money for it, but we want it in perpetuity. And as you can imagine, there were some who were interested in that, but there were many, you know, perpetuity, last time I checked, was a real long time. And uh, some were not so interested in that. And they, they were out of the game then. Well, that doesn't work for me. We've got to break down that paradigm we've got to start offering and accepting and considering 20, 30, 40, 50 year easements on some of these properties. We've got to make it, we've got to incentivize it for the landowners. We've got to make this thing work. And if we can, we are going to have this, this green readiness around our bases and stations and under our military training routes and in conjunction with all these other outfits that we're going to partner with. That's the grand plan. You know, in the, in the past, when we talked about to the, to the civil sector compatibility and we want compatible use, well, what we were really talking about there was was the civil sector becoming compatible with the military? You know, well, thanks a lot, right? <laughs> that's, that's not very compatible. It's certainly one way. Um, and so I am, I'm very interested in, in doing what I can to, to demonstrate genuine compatibility. And uh, this is one of the... Uh, projects we're working on is food and fuel for the force. You know, why in the world aren't I buying a ton of locally produced foodstuffs that are being used in our commissaries, that are being used in our chow halls, that are being used in our hospitals, that are being consumed in our schools? Why aren't I buying locally? encouraging our smaller farmers to produce this stuff, to keep their farms in farming. Why, why haven't we been doing that forever? Well, you know, the reason is it's economics, and we have an outfit called DECA who's wonderful folks, um, but, but their model doesn't incorporate this right now. But you know and I know that this model works because you, you can walk down to your local grocery store and you see an awful lot of locally produced fresh produce, fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh meat, and it sells. Why does it sell? It sells because it's real fresh, it's real local, and it's real good. That's why. This will work. Their model needs to change. I'm trying to... Uh, to sell that to them. This is what I just got done talking about. Uh, I, am, I am working with DECA to try, and, to try and bring this about, to try and bring inroads uh, on this. Uh, this is one small step, but it's, I think it could have a huge impact. 
to the local community and, and even regional community if, if we can pull this off. Uh, and this is not just the Marine Corps, of course. This would be every armed service uh, in the fullness of, of time. We do have some problems, certainly. You know, if any of you are, uh, how many people in this room knows, knows what GAP stands for and it's not a gene store? <clears throat> okay, not, not a whole bunch. It's uh, good agricultural practices is what it stands for. And there are, uh, by the way, I, I, I found that out about nine months ago, so don't feel stupid. Um, the, uh, before you can sell your produce um, to a large firm, you've got to have the right GAP certifications in place. And it's fairly onerous if you're a local landowner. Um, it's, it's, it can be very expensive. You have to buy some new equipment. You have to do an awful lot of testing. Uh, and so that's a concern. Uh, just selling locally produced produce is not as easy as it might otherwise seem. So we're working with that. We're working with prime, prime vendors, as I said, with DECA, uh, uh, to maximize these opportunities. And also, obviously, working with everyone to identify those products that provide the best opportunity for integration uh, in, into this industrial buying process. The other half of this food and fuel for the forces is, uh, is biomass. The, uh, the military goes through, uh, literally and figuratively, a ton of biomass. Uh, when we clear forests, when we, just through the process of training, when we, uh, when we clear the, the forest understory, uh, that's all going to waste, mo mainly. Uh, we need to harness that and, and do that, hopefully, in conjunction with the state. North Carolina has, uh, has set up this uh, biofuels center, and uh, it's still very much in the, uh, in the growth stage at this point. But I want to I wanna support that. I want to support them with biomass. I would like to have, uh, I almost did have, but it, uh, unfortunately, for a number of reasons, it didn't work out, my own biomass facility <clears throat> where I can try and kick the petrochemical habit that, that the military and America is, is hooked on right now. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to arc off here uh, in a well right now on another area that has nothing to do with this slide. I I am under some rather stringent uh, mandates. By 2015, I am supposed to reduce my energy consumption by 30 percent against a 2003 baseline. By 2015, 30 percent. 2003, do it by 2015. That's, that's considerable. <clears throat> I will tell you, I'm into just about every alternative energy you can possibly imagine uh, other, than, uh, other than wind power. Not that we're against wind power, but wind power, uh, the, the veins have uh, induced a, a radar reflectivity uh, that, that really does mess up aviation. Um, <clears throat> and it's, uh, I think, that the technology will catch up to that where in, in the future it no longer will, but right now it does. So I love wind power, but I just want them far enough away where it doesn't impact with my aviation. Uh, but uh, this is huge um, if we get this going. It will help our nation. It's the right thing to do. Uh, and also as an example of how interested I am in alternative forms of energy uh, in, uh, in Camp Lejeune alone this year, I'm spending about $160 million on uh, photovoltaics. Uh, and that's, that's real money. <laughs> You're very kind. It's actually your money. <laughs> Another example of, uh, of using OPM, other people's money, um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're working with, with, with this, these folks, again, to encourage the preservation of agricultural, horticultural, and forest land. Um, 
North Carolina has really been uh, way ahead of some other states on this, I, I believe, in really trying to, to put their money where their mouth is in, in maintaining farms, uh, lo locally, uh, locally managed farms and, and forest and protecting them both. Um, as you can see, the state averages $100,000 acres, acres over the past five years that have been lost. We're never going to get that back, ever. The only way we can mitigate future losses like this is to be proactive and to get on it now. Obviously, we're very concerned, as uh, probably everyone in this room is, uh, or most of you, about uh, longleaf pine. Uh, again, this is, all goes back really to being environmental stewards, great environmental stewards. It's, it's not just longleaf pine, it's the red cockaded wood, woodpecker down in, in uh, Blunt Island, Florida, my, on the fringes of my empire. It's the gopher tortoise. Uh, yeah, we take care. We take this very, very seriously. Um, and it also impacts our ability to train, but our ability to, to train will be sacrificed before we Im impinge upon uh, our environmental responsibilities because it's statutory. I must do that. So I don't want you worrying about it. But we take this stuff really, really seriously. Um, a, a quick bit, bit on market-based conservation and uh, I, I talked about it. I think we all know the why of that. Um, we are currently trying to, uh, to work with a number of organizations to, to get easements on properties under some of our military uh, aviation training routes, which traverse uh, eastern North Carolina. And we're, we're trying to do this in a way that is not in, in perpetuity, but is um, we, we get these shorter term easements and this is going to be difficult. It really is. It's, uh, it hasn't been done before. Um, some of the money changers are loath to, uh, loath to commit, with it, commit money to this when, well, this is only for 20, 30 years and we're going to pay them maybe, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 dollars an acre for this and at the end of that they could just say, you know, to heck with you, we're walking away. Yeah, they could. But I'm betting they won't. Um, I think this program, if we start it right, and we let the success of the program do, do our talking for us, and we let, let the local landowners do our talking for us, um, I think this can gain a lot of traction, and it will keep those farms in farming. Uh, you know, we have a, a generational issue, at least in, uh, in North Carolina, I suspect it's sa the same in many of the other states, that uh, the farmers are getting very old. And they're at the point now where they're looking at the end of the road and what's going to happen to this farm that I got from my father and he got from his father. It's been in the family for over a century and I've got my two knucklehead children, Carl and Paul, <laughs> who, you know, aren't worth a lick. <laughs> and I'm not sure I want to give them the farm. But I know I love them. I love us both. But I'm hoping maybe in 20, 30 years they'll grow up and they'll understand what the value of this farm really is to the family. Huh. Maybe this easement, maybe this 20, 30 year easement looks a lot better now. Um, and I think there's a lot of that going on uh, to, as a, not only a means of, of generating revenue without doing much, but as a way of, of keeping these farms exactly the way they are. This is that military training route that I was talking about. And this is our current grand project in Marine Corps Installations East. We are partnering left, right, and down the middle to try and get easements 
underneath the, uh, the red slash line that, uh, that you see on the map there. Now, that's pretty exciting to me for a number of reasons. Now, to me, just as, as, as your average knuckle-dragon troglodyte jarhead, um, that looks a lot like an ecological corridor <clears throat> if we could lock up those lands, um, put get easements on them. That's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting for longleaf pine propagation, uh, for endangered and threatened species. It will allow a corridor for wildlife and flora and fauna. I, I'm pretty pumped about that. Now, let's step this up one level. This is a military training, aviation training route. That's what the rest of the military aviation training routes look on a small slice of the eastern seaboard. Does that appeal to anybody in the room? You want corridors? You got corridors. You have corridors in the air. If, through partnering together, we could get a start on this and get easements, on some of the land underneath those training routes. That's exciting. That's a prospect that appeals to me, I suspect appeals to you, and it's grandiose enough to stir excitement. And I think worthy of us all. So, Final thoughts. You're, I know you've probably waited for that one. <laughs> if, you, if you care, and I know you do, but natural resources, working lands, valuable landscapes at larger scales, or national defense, hey, national defense, we've got to work together on this. Ben Franklin had it right. Ben Franklin had it right there. And, and that would be... My, uh, my message to you all, you've been extraordinarily gracious. Thank you very much. We're really, again, very honored that you came and your definition of an interconnected network of open spaces, natural lands, and working landscapes is, of course, what we consider a definition of green infrastructure. So you're right, absolutely in sync. Are there questions? So, Softballs are appreciated. Um, he's, he's, he's a general. Ma so. Major General Jensen, it's great <laughs> to see you again, sir. Um, was with you at Fort Campbell for the Surpass Conference. And at that time, you were promoting the idea of the Southeast Greenway which I thought was one of the most exciting things I'd seen, uh, of connecting all the military bases all the way down through Alabama and Florida in a large buffer zone. And it wasn't just the air routes. We were talking at the time about um, your training that's on the ground and the need that you had to buffer against the massive amount of suburban encroachment that is really overtaking your bases. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind speaking about that for just a second. Well, it's, it's, it's just an expansion on on what we just were discussing here. You know, we have islands of, of extraordinarily uh, sophisticated environmental protection. Environmental protection. Uh, and we do a great job on, on these islands. We've got we've to have corridors. It's just a, another corridor where, where we would link up with all the other services and our training ranges and try and get these corridors going um, to the benefit of all. Um, again, at the end of the day, this has to appeal to everyone's self-interest. The military's self-interest is that we're here 50 years from now, is that our ability to train both on the ground, on our bases, and at the ranges that we have off base and the, the interconnected, uh, or the, on the military aviation routes that, it, that connect these bases and ranges is available to us. We can do that 
by partnering with federal and state and local agencies and local landowners. And we can also do that by working with other you know, military outfits where we all join together and try and do the exact same thing. So really, it's just an extension of that. Uh, in fact, really, that preceded the, the, the military training routes, but it was something I could, I could attempt to do locally uh, and, and get that ball moving while at the same time working with, our, uh, with the other uh, military outfits. Hi there. Th uh, first of all, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, and I, I live in North Carolina, but in the western part of the state, and I appreciate the hearing about all the great initiatives in the eastern part of the state. My question is about the um, conservation easements and uh, why, uh, why you're only going for temporary easements for 20 or 30 years and not longer term easements and what the financial incentives are that you're providing with that. So just a little more detail on that. Well, okay. I, obviously, I misspoke. I would love to get everything in perpetuity. I would, that would be, that's the gold standard. And if, and if a, a local landowner was willing to, uh, to, to give the United States government a, a perpetual easement on, on his property, his or her property, oh, I'd be all over that like a cheap suit. Uh, no doubt in my military mind. But that's not going to appeal to everyone. You know, um, a lot of people, you find, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, are a tad distrustful of the feds, <laughs> right? I mean, they are. They're, they're, they just, I don't know, I'm not in perpetuity. That's a, just a long time. What if I change my mind? What if I want to do X, Y, or Z? But it's always been in perpetuity. So we're very interested. We think it's an absolute ne necessity to start out with smaller chunks uh, with these 20, 30, 40 year uh, easements, give them the opportunity to do, to pick which one fits for them. You know, not everybody's the same. Um, they have individual preferences. I personally, out of my own pocketbook here, uh, my command pocketbook, funded a, a study, a local landowner's preference survey that, that you saw on one of the other slides to see what was important to them uh, in, in eastern North Carolina, uh, how, they, how they felt about it, how they felt about dealing with the government, frankly. Uh, and, and there are some suspicious sorts out there based upon some previous bad engagement, I guess, or they just don't know, or they are in a unique situation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to answer the, the second half of your question is what inducements are, are, we, uh, are we thinking about? Uh, the, the sweet spot seems to be about, uh, on average, under the, uh, the military training routes you saw in that, in that red arc, about $12 an acre. You know, depend, maybe you know, 10 to 14 might be the range, depending on, on what kind of property you own. Uh, but, but $12 is probably a, uh, a good figure. Hi, I'm Lisa Warnicke from uh, SUNY ESF in Syracuse, and thank you for a very inspiring talk. Um, I found it very, I, the, the notion of partnering with local levels is, is a, a strong one that we've heard also from Dr. Armstrong and from others here at this whole event, so that was uh, very good to hear. These guys stole my shtick. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're all, I think you and I are probably about the same vintage, perhaps, and we've been, unfortunately, hearing it for decades. I'm a former uh, town manager many decades back, <laughs> and, uh, you and have my uh, condolences. we heard it then, the goodies over the fence. But, but let me just, a couple quick questions. Um, one is, um, I, I, one thing I didn't hear from you, and I'm familiar with, and I'm sure you are, the Western Regional Partnership that the Army has in the Western states. One thing I didn't hear from you was if you could speak to a, a key part of that initiative with those, I think, eight or ten Western states from California to Texas is, is GIS, utilizing, leveraging, partnering regarding GIS. That's one question I have. Um, and then secondly, I was very glad to hear that you explicitly stated the need for a parcel by parcel approach. This is something that uh, federal agencies, particularly interior, uh, 
uh, does not necessarily, and Dr. Armstrong, I'm speaking to you in this regard, don't want to really look at that, attempts, address the issue of parcel to parcel, but that's really the heart of the matter in reaching out to landowners and having the data resources appropriately. And, you, and you've spoken quite a bit about North Carolina. They have a unique database and, re, and um, funding mechanism to have uh, very good quality parcel by parcel data that would be wonderful if the federal agencies could help incentivize that in other states. Reaching out, um, federal agencies reaching out to locals is an important theme as, as you've brought up. But synchronizing that outreach is an important one. Local, local governments have land use authority in the United States. There's probably about 40,000 units of local government with land use authority in this country, maybe close to 50. There's 80,000 totally. But, but reaching out to them is, is critical. But on the ground, you also have an extensive federal field structure of thousands, literally thousands, of federal officials that are representing the Department of Interior, USDA, and other federal agencies that are, could serve as resources in some of your initiatives as well, and many of them are here at this conference, as you know. And then, la yeah, and my last question, my last question, my last question. Hey, this is a Marine. And this is quick, you know? is a comment to the question about the <laughs> I ocean. I can remember two things. Your agency, your agency and Interior and all of the other feds participated just last month in the National Council for Science and the Environment had their annual conference about the oceans. And it was just last month at the Reagan Building. So anyone who's interested in the oceans, you might want to look at the NCSC 2011 Oceans Conference. And, and these agencies were all represented there and there was quite a bit of information there on the topics that were brought up. So I encourage you to check that out. So those questions were GIS, so <laughs> synchronized federal outreach. To local. So. Well, I thought the only real question there that, that I picked up on was, was really the GIS yeah. question. Um, but, but I'll double back on anything else you want me to. We uh, absolutely, uh, we got that one. You know, the, if we're going to move ahead smartly, we have, ha have to have what Bill Ross, who was a former uh, deaner in North Carolina, said called the good map. 